since I've read through the text with you, I'm just going to jump right into, if you are not a believer in this room, the first half of this message is aimed directly at you. It's a sniper round. God's message in this parable, parables are earthly stories with eternal significance, okay? This parable is about two types of people. The first type of people that you hear is, it, we know that it's ten virgins, five of them are fools or foolish, the other five are wise. Let me focus on the foolish. This is the message for uh, the sinner. The most significant thing the Bible says about a fool is that the fool has said in his heart there is no God, according to Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. If you read Luke chapter 12, the parable of the rich fool, you might be familiar with it, this man who has tons of stuff, and he says, look at all my stuff. i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my bones, I'm going to build up more, and then I'm going to store all my stuff in there. God comes to him and he says, you fool, tonight I will require your soul of you, and then who's, uh, to, to whom will belong those things that you have stored up? The reason God calls him a fool, the reason that the Bible says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God, there's a common misconception about fools. There's a common misconception about atheists as well. People think that the word atheist means that you do not believe in God, but that's not what the word etymologically means. Atheist literally means non-theist or not a theist. A theist is a person who believes in a supreme being or all-powerful ruler of heaven and earth. Ultimately, an atheist can believe that God does exist, but God doesn't matter. And ultimately, when the Bible says the fool has said in his heart that there is no God, we don't see any time where the rich fool says God doesn't exist. More so what he does is he acts like God does not exist. When it comes to what he's going to do with his stuff, he decides. He is autonomous. He says it's my stuff and I do with it what I please when I want to. <laughs> and there are many of us who have yet to meet the Lord that are that way. When uh, Goody talks to you, Goody is what we call Aaron Good. He is a good man. Um, <laughs> Some of you get the pun. I bet they are English right? Okay. Um, uh, uh, what was my point? Um, for the sinner, when we talk about what it looks like to be a sinner, it's selfish. It's impulsive. It's numb to God and to God's agenda. We do what we want to when we want to for as long as we want to. We do not have God in mind. We do not have God at heart. When we talk about a summer, when we talk about what we do with our plans, it's amazing to me that Goody asks the question, how many of you know what you're doing with your summer? And I feel like more hands went up than how many of you have prayed about what you should do with your summer. I think that the idea there is, I know what I want to do, but I haven't asked the Lord's leading on what he wants me to do. Why is that? Because we live in an American culture that loves the American dream that sticks you somewhere for four years in an incubator and think that when you come out, you're going to be smarter than you were. And that's not necessarily true. Those of us who have graduated can attest to it. We are no smarter than we were than when, when before we went into college. The major difference is we might be wiser. And we'll talk about what wisdom is in just a second. The other thing that the Bible says about a fool, according to what we learn in Proverbs, is that a fool is hot-headed and does not heed instruction, does not listen to wisdom. And so what do we see happen with these five people, virgins, who are supposed to be waiting for the bridegroom? What is the significance of that? There were times in Jewish culture, I mean, it's not much different at a wedding now. Y'all know what I'm talking about, a bachelorette party or a bachelor's party. You, you do that before the wedding, right? You don't really do that after. And so if you can imagine, this is the night before the wedding or perhaps even the night of the wedding. And what they have done is they have sent out these ten virgins that they might meet the bridegroom and then usher the bridegroom in. If you listen, you're going to catch a whole lot of things. Again, I'm not going to go through the whole analogy, but if you are biblical at all, there's no way you can't hear what the analogy is saying. But what they do is they go out, they meet the bridegroom, and then they bring him to his bride for whom he has suffered and toiled to win her to himself. Right? So they go out and they get the bridegroom and they bring him to his spouse, his wife, in order that they might be wed. So the whole job of these ten people is to make sure that their lamps are burning bright when the bridegroom comes. That's it. Yet what do we find them doing? We find all of them sleeping. Once they awake because they've heard the fact that the bridegroom is coming, what do they do? These five jump up, their lamps are empty, and they say, look, we need some help. We need somebody to come along with us. Why am I saying that? And what is a little bit in this analogy? What is the Bible teaching? Two things I said in my prayer. The Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, that God commands that all people everywhere repent. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are. God has given you right now in, in your hearing an opportunity to repent. Repenting is not a suggestion from God. You repent or you die. You lost. He you separate. Deuces, holla, you're done. Stick a fork in you, peace out. 
Because you won't have peace with God or of God at all. I want you to understand that. The Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this death the judgment. Now, what will you be judged on? Will you be judged on the good and the bad that you did? Absolutely not. If you are a sinner in the sight of God, you are always a sinner. Your sin is not covered. That means no matter how much good you do, as far as God is concerned, your nature, your very nature, your makeup, we call it noumena, what you are in and of yourself, offends God. You are born separated from him, and there's no ability to get to him. How many of you have seen the movie Courageous? Anybody seen the movie Courageous up in here? Like three people. Awesome. That's great because then this analogy will make sense to you. It's a philosophical argument. If somebody slaughters your mama in public in a, in, in, a, in a supermarket grocery store, right, and that person was put on trial and you were the judge, if that person looked at you and said, but look at all of the good things I've done, won't you let me off the hook? What would you say? Yeah, dude, you've been awesome. You know, except for you slaughtering my mama like she was a pig. Yeah, you can. No, you wouldn't do that. Why? Because not just you want revenge. That's not the issue. The issue is this person has committed a heinous crime, manslaughter, period. And so naturally, as a good judge, you're going to judge them the way that they need to be sentenced. God is the same way. If you stand in front of God with no mediator, nobody standing on your behalf, you have a nature that offends him unless something is done about your nature. We are born in sin, bound to sin, blinded by sin. Sin is what I like to call the self-focused, independent, impulsive numbness to God and God's agenda. Because Adam ate the fruit years and years and years ago, all of us are born that way, shaped in iniquity according to what the Bible says in Psalm chapter 51, verse 5. That means in order for us to believe, the first thing we must do is repent. As a matter of fact, when we repent, we confess to the Lord. The Greek word for confess is homo logia, okay? The reason I'm telling you that is, you know what homo means, it means same. The word logia is the word where we get the word logos, or logic, it means word or reason. To confess, you put these two things together, it's the idea of the same reason or the same word. You are agreeing with God what God already knows about you. You are standing in front of God saying, God, I am rightfully condemned as a person who has not kept your law in word, thought, and deed from birth to death. You've heard me say this before if you heard me speak at all. If you've ever sinned, that makes you a sinner. It's a pretty easy argument. If you ain't perfect, you need a Savior, right? That means all of us need a Savior. If you're up in here and you say you're perfect, you just lied, you need a Savior. All right, cool? <laughs> James chapter 2, verse 10 says, If you seek to keep the law at every point where you offended in one, you are guilty of the entire law. All of it. So if you are lost in this room, you do not know Jesus Christ and what we call the free pardon of your sin. That means you have not received Jesus as your Savior. You have not been covered in his blood. You have not confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, according to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Then you still remain in your sin. And as far as God is concerned, your nature offends him. He loves you, but he hates your sin so much that he's willing to be separated from you forever. In this time, according to Acts chapter 17, verse 30, he commands your repentance. He commands that you turn around, not now, right now. He commands that you turn around. That is the message in this passage for the lost. How can I prove it? After Jesus tells the whole story, what does Jesus say? Look at verse 13. Jesus says, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man will come. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Why is he saying that? Because Jesus can crack the sky any moment. There is nothing... I'm about to use some big words and then I explain what they mean. There's nothing on the prophetic horizon precluding Jesus from coming back right now. What I mean by that is, right now, Jesus could come and retrieve the reward for his suffering, his church, all believers. He could do that right this second. He could do that before I'm finished this message or at your very next breath. And he is commanding your repentance. I don't say that to scare you is what the Bible teaches, and that's what Jesus is saying in this passage, particularly to the lost, those five who are willing to be foolish. Am, does that make sense? Yes, sir. Cool. Now can I move to the wise? Because for those of you who are believers, you're like, okay, talk to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. Let me talk to you. There are other five that are wise. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 1, verse 7, and in chapter 10, and in chapter 15, verse 33, that the, the beginning of wisdom, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? It's the beginning of knowledge. When you fear the Lord, that shows that you are wise. The word wise comes from the same word where we get the word vision. It means that your eyes are open and you're enlightened. You're able to see, right? Your whole job, listen, your whole job is to be awaiting the presence of the bridegroom. We all know what waiting is like. Anybody got any family members or relatives that are in the armed forces? 
Anybody cool? I have a brother who's in the army. He is stationed in Hawaii. I see him about twice a year. And I can tell you what it is like when I know that my brother is supposed to be coming home. There is this excitement that is built in me. If you have a loved one that you haven't seen in a long time, it is like that. When there's this excitement built in you. What happens when you get a phone call? I know what happens for me. I don't know what it is for you. You get a phone call and you find out that that person is delayed. That ever happened to you? Or somebody's supposed to meet you somewhere and you find out that they're delayed. I don't know how many of you know Rob Holtis. He and I met this morning. We were supposed to meet at Starbucks at 9.30. He texted me and said, hey, I won't be there until 9.45. He was delayed. You know what happened to me, right? I begin to think, what am I going to do with this extra, five minutes, uh, this extra 15 minutes? And, and so, you know, driving through the city of Richmond, I, I found out what to do with my extra 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> some of y'all get what I'm saying. Um, but very seriously, I have four kids. I have a wife. Uh, this spans a five-day trip where we will be on the road, Goody and I. We left yesterday, and we'll be on the road until Sunday afternoon and come home to a Super Bowl party, which will be pretty fun. When I get home, my goal and expectation as I walk into the house, don't lose the point. Don't lose the point. I get to walk into the house and see my beautiful wife, the woman that I married, right? I get to see my beautiful children. I have a, a, a newborn. He's not really a newborn. Nay, he's huge. He's a month old. He doesn't look like a newborn, but he basically is. But he's like the size of my three-month-old niece. Anyway, um, <laughs> but I walk into the house, and what happens? I light up because I see them. They are the joy. They are what I have longed for. For that three and a half hour drive as we go home, that whole three and a half hour trip, I'm thinking about my wife. I'm thinking about when I can embrace my kids. I'm thinking about when I can kiss my wife. I'm thinking about when I can hold my wife. I'm thinking about watching the Super Bowl party with her because she went to college with Eli Manning. And I think that's a very fun thing. So it's like, yes, I get to make this happen. I'm rooting for the Patriots. I'm just kidding. Uh, very seriously. Um, I, I, I love that expectation. Listen, that was their job. Their job was... This is our friend who's getting married. This is our friend who is marrying her. Anybody ever been a best man or like maid of honor in a wedding? Any of y'all yet? Maybe you're not old enough yet because you ain't got enough friends that old enough getting married. But awesome. You're excited, aren't you? You're excited to see your friend lock it up with his wife. You're excited to see your, 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 your friend lock it up with her husband, whatever. Um, <laughs> and so your whole job and goal is to make sure that everything runs smoothly, right? That's what these five wives were supposed to be doing. But what do we find them doing? We find them doing the same exact thing that we find the foolish ones doing. They're asleep. They're slumbering. As a matter of fact, the Greek word carries this idea of, y'all know how when you get real tired, you just start nodding off? Y'all know what I'm talking about? You yeah. see people who do that? That's the idea in Greek. It's not that these people are straight up out snoring with their mouth wide open, their flies and spiders crawling in their mouth and stuff. The idea is more that they are just carried away with sleep. They've been lulled to sleep with a false sense of security. There's this idea that the bridegroom is late, so he's not going to show up for a little bit. Y'all know Christians are a trip because we say we look for the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ and we are looking for him to crack the sky and take us home. But the reality is for most of us who are doing life like Jesus wants us to do life who ain't married yet, we hoping we get married first. <laughs> and we know great, good, and well. Don't trip and don't act like you ain't never had this thought. <laughs> if it was your wedding night and you done done things like you're supposed to and you knew Jesus was going to crack the sky, you go, give me five minutes. Jesus, just give me five minutes. I've been looking for your return all of my life, but give me just five more minutes. That's all I need. <laughs> Why am I saying this? Why am I saying this? I know it sounds funny, folks. But is it the reality that we really don't want Jesus to crack the sky right now? we got some goals that we want to complete. we got some things that we want to see happen. We want to maybe get married. We want to see our kids raised up. We want to see some other things happen. We want to see ourselves get out of the $27,000 worth of debt that we're currently in. There are things that we want to see and do before we die. And so many of us are not looking for the returning kingdom of God. Many of us are not looking for Jesus to return. So it's a whole lot easier to walk out of these doors and forget about Jesus completely and forget about the dying world that's out there and forget about the dying campus and forget about the person that might be your sweet mate that doesn't know Jesus at all and parties every weekend and we sit back and talk about them and our holiness and in our righteousness falling asleep with a false sense of security. And we think that we sit in our righteous. I love that the text says that they come to those who are wise and say, give us some of your oil. And I think the world is begging for our oil. And instead of us giving them our oil, instead of us allowing ourselves to be endowed and filled with the Holy Spirit in such a way that we take over a campus with the gospel, we sit back and say, look, I ain't got enough. I don't know enough. I can't disciple you. I can't teach you. I can't show you what it looks like to know Jesus. I don't know enough. The reality is Jesus says the same thing to both. My question to you tonight is which one are you? 
Notice, notice, both of them are asleep. I want to read you something Paul says in Romans chapter 13. If you have your Bible, you can turn there. Uh, I didn't give them this on the slide, so you're just going to have to listen. Or if you got your Bible or your smartphone, you can turn there. In Romans 13, here's something that Paul says uh, to the Roman church to kind of stir them. He says, and that knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the work of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the daytime, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for your flesh to gratify the desires thereof. If you are a believer in this room, the message to you is very simple. The Bible says that the grace of God, in Titus chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, the Bible says that the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present world, looking for the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know how many of you are like me. I love sports. For heaven's sake, I work at a Christian sports camp. I love sports. I got a chance to do a basketball practice right before I came here. Don't worry, I showered. But I got a chance to teach uh, some guys basketball before I got a chance to come here. I am really looking forward to the Super Bowl. I am really looking forward to the All-Star Game basketball because I'm a big basketball fan. I'm really looking forward to the NBA Finals. And looking forward to those things, there's an anticipation about it. I call my brothers and we talk about it on the phone. We dialogue about it. Anybody who loves basketball, as we get together, we talk about it and we enjoy it. How many of you like Tetris? Anybody in here like Tetris? <laughs> cool. When I was a teenager, the game, the new Tetris for the Nintendo 64 came out. Don't worry, I'm going to end after this story. I played Tetris morning, noon, and night, and I could only get in a marathon race. Y'all know what marathon is if you've played the new Tetris, just listen. In a marathon race, I could only get about 800 lines, and I thought I was somebody. <laughs> and so when I got married, I moved up to southwestern Pennsylvania. I have a neighbor. His name is Steve Hall. Steve also grew up playing the new Tetris. Steve came to my house and would play with me, and I was always playing marathon. And don't worry, I got to the place where I could get about 4,000 lines in marathon. And so then I did think I was somebody, although the world record is 164,000 lines and it took you to do 24, 28 hours. Anyway, um, and you can watch the whole thing on YouTube. Don't worry, I did not. I have a life. I can't waste it that way. Um, and so, so Steve came into my house, and Steve said, why do you play? If you listen to this, you will catch the meaning of this text. He said, why do you play marathon? I said, well, because I want to see how many lines I can get. He said, well, it's not hard to just get a bunch of lines. I said, man, shoot, once you get to 4,000, they speed up. You can't even see them. They just <laughs> blink down the screen. You're just trying to stay alive. He said, well, why don't you play sprint? And I said, what is sprint? And he looked at me like I was an alien. Listen, and you'll catch it. What is sprint? He looked at me like I was an alien. He said, let me show you what sprint is. You get as many lines as you can in, I think, three minutes. And so we started playing sprint, and Steve crushed the mess out of me, because I was real methodical. I'm used to playing marathon where, listen, where I got all kind of time to kind of build my little kingdom at the bottom of the screen. And I keep building my, my, my kingdom and building my kingdom and building my kingdom until I can drop them all in the middle, and I'm creating silver and gold boxes all the way up the screen. Well, when it was only three minutes, I didn't have that kind of time. Since I didn't have that kind of time, I had to completely change focus in the way that I played the game, the new Tetris. But from what I already knew, I took what Steve taught me, and I got to the point where I could beat Steve pretty easily. I got to the point where I could get about 800, almost 800 lines in three minutes. What am I saying? There's not a lot of time left, folks. And I know it's easy to look at Scripture and say, man, Paul said it was the last days, and my grandma daddy said it was the last days, and everybody's saying it's the last days. Look, folks, that, that ain't a lot of time left. And I really do believe, I keep hearing this from my mentors, and I keep saying it as well, I really do believe, not only are we living in the last days, but I really do believe in my lifetime, Jesus will come back. I, I'm not predicting that. Don't leave here saying, Timothy said Jesus was coming back on certain <laughs> But I'm more so saying, when you look at the signs of the time, when you understand Bible, particularly if you're reading Daniel or Revelation, man, we are close. I mean real close on the brink of the end. When I look at my Bible, when I look at my children, when I look at my wife, there's no time to waste. There's no time to sit there building my kingdom playing marathon. What I have to do is get a Steve Hall, a Paul in my life to teach me the things that I don't know about this word. 
I need somebody in my life to encourage me, to spur me on to love and to good deeds. You know, when Steve and I started playing Tetris, we started learning from each other. We started talking about Tetris. And anybody who knows Tetris, we would get with those people and we'd talk about Tetris and we'd enjoy Tetris. Anybody who hadn't played Tetris, you know what I did, right? I did this with my Nintendo Wii when I first got it. I started going to people and I started saying, you need to get one. Uh, <laughs> when I got my iPhone, bless the Lord, I was blessed with an iPhone. And when I got one, I got Boxer and I got Haytel. And you know what I did? Uh, if you have Boxer or Haytail, everybody and they mama. I said, you got to have this. You got to have this. You got to have this. If I can do it with Boxer or Haytail, I need to be able to do it with the gospel, don't I? Amen. Because the gospel is way more relevant. And if I'm going to Haytail anything, I need to Haytail the gospel.